let's bow our heads. We pray, Father in heaven today, we have come to hear a word from you. We have heard so many from so many individuals, but now this is your time. And God, we dare not open your word without consulting you. I ask in the name of Jesus that you will show up as only you can show up. I pray that you will exalt yourself as only you can exalt yourself. I am asking you, Jesus, that you will remove Leonardo out of the way, that I will not be seen, I will not be heard. This is not my time. This is your time. These are not my people. They are your people. This is not my word. This is your word. And so, God, I'm asking you today that you will use me as that nail on the wall on which the picture of Jesus is hung securely. And I ask that the nail will never be seen, but that the beautiful, gorgeous, handsome face of Jesus will always be seen that will be lifted up high and mighty. And at the end of it all, oh God, may some sinner return to you. May some sinner yield over everything to you. And may you gain the victory, the praise, the glory, and the honor. This be our prayer today in Jesus' name. Hear ye the word of God. Thank you, Ellen McCoy, for reading for us today from the word of God, Malachi. Micah, Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Micah chapter 6. You've heard it. I will not read it again. But we're going to Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, visiting friends, if someone breaks the law and acts against you in some way to harm you, or go against your rights as a citizen of this country, the Bahamas, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, you have the option to either press charges against the person. And then if the person is convicted, there is a fine or a jail time. Am I correct? There is a price to be paid by the offending party. And the truth is, beloved brothers and sisters, friends of mine today, it is a serious thing to be confronted by God about our sins. In chapter six of Micah, we step into a courtroom where God would bring his case against the people who should have been serving and worshiping him. Friends of mine, they had broken the covenant. God is now confronting his people about their sin, and, and Micah will plead God's case. Micah is, is the one who will plead God's case. He is actually God's representative standing before the people, and God was going to prosecute the people based on their sin. God is pressing charges. But I want you to see the gravity of this today because the Bible declares in verse 1 of Micah chapter 6, the Bible says, Hear ye, O mountains, the Lord's controversy and you strong foundations of the earth. He says, For the Lord hath a controversy with his people and he will plead with Israel. These words, beloved brothers and sisters, uh, of our text this morning, today, rather, are startling as they are pathetic. In fact, when I go to the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, and I want you to go there very quickly with me, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, I, I see something there in verse 31. The Bible tells me that God has a controversy with the nations which oppressed his people. The Bible says a noise will come up to the ends of the earth. For the Lord have a controversy with the nations. He will plead his case with all flesh. He will give those who are wicked to the sword. And then I run across to Hosea chapter 4 and verse 1. And here is what the Bible says, Elatai. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. 
this controversy that God has with his people is not the first because it didn't start here on earth. In fact, the Bible tells me very clearly that this controversy was one that started in heaven. Here it is in Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 12, beloved brothers and sisters. Go there with me for a moment. Revelation, the 12th chapter. And I want you to begin at verse 7. Here is what the Bible says. The Bible says, and what? War broke out in where? Michael and his angels fought with the what? And the dragon and his angels did what? But they did not what? Prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any what? So the great dragon was what? Cast out that serpent of old called the what? And Satan who deceives the whole what? The world. And he was cast to the what? And his angels were what? Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them what? Before our God day and night has been what? Cast down. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, and they what? Come on, read with me, brothers and sisters. And they what? Overcame him by the what? Blood of the lamb and by the what? Word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to what? Therefore rejoice, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Listen to me today, beloved saints of God. Time is not as long as it used to be. Listen to me, Grand Stout. The Lord has a controversy with his people. You see, our text states very clearly that God has a controversy with his own people. You see, friends of mine, the Bible matches and, and states to us that with them, he has brought them up. He has uh, cared for them. He has nurtured them. I don't know if you've ever had that experience before where you have done everything for someone and they turn their backs on you. Have you ever felt like that? Where you have given them your all. You've been loyal to them. You have given them all that you had to give them. But yet at the end of the day, Brother George, they turn their backs on you and they make you feel as though you did nothing for them. Listen to me. The Lord says, this is the controversy that I have toward my people. <laughs> can I tell you, can I tell you today, can I tell you today? Look at it, look at it, look a little further. The Bible says that he starts in Micah chapter 6. He says, oh, my people. Notice what he's doing. He's not talking to some stranger, Brother McKenzie. He's not talking to some stranger. He's talking to those whom he rescued out of the clutches of the dragon's hands. He's talking to those who, who, who he, he, he took out of Egypt, those who were his, those whom he nurtured, those whom he cared for, those whom he supplied their needs, but yet they turned against him. He says, oh, my people, remember this. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me today. I don't know if you've ever gotten weary with doing the Lord's work. But I've come by to tell you today, the Lord's work should never be burdensome. You see, you see, we have to be careful of calling evil good in the sight of the Lord because he does not delight when we call good bad and bad good. God wants us to understand that this is a controversy. We can't turn a blind eye to that which is wrong. 
And so, and so, and so how does God deal with this controversy? Let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you, let me tell you what God does. God recalls his mercies to the people of Israel. Let me teach you a lesson. Let me teach you a lesson to this morning. And I want you to listen to me. Let me, let me teach you a lesson. Before you give something that is negative, always give a positive. I'm teaching you something, church. Because sometimes as a church, we like to talk about what is not happening. What cannot happen? What did not happen? What was wrong? Tell me what was right. Tell me how it went well. You know, I, I, as a Toastmaster, I, I went to join Toastmasters years ago, and they said to me, you know, there's something when they, when they, when they critique you in, in your speaking, and they critique you, and one of the things they say to me, you know, uh, before you start talking about how the person didn't speak, how the person uh, began to arm and ah and all those kind of stuff, he says, you must always tell them what they did right. You see, you, you always bring the positive before the negative. And so God now in Micah chapter 6, God says, look here. Yes, I know that you have not been doing right. But he says, look here. I am going to let you know that you are my people. God says, look here. Remember now. Let me recall, recall this. He says, remember that, 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 that I was with you when you were in Egypt. He says, oh, my people, remember. Look at verse 5. Look at verse five. Go back. Micah, Micah chapter 6. I want you to go back there with me. Micah chapter 6. Look at verse 5. He says what? He says what in verse 5? Oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Acacia Grove to Gilgal. He says that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. You and I must understand how grievous it, it must be to our heavenly father when you and I grow weary of his, uh, 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 through forgetfulness of all of his benefits. Hasn't God been good to you? Hasn't God woken you up this morning? Didn't he, didn't he clothe you? Didn't he give you food in your mouth? Didn't he give you a shelter over your head? Didn't he provide for you gas to get in your, put in your car so that you can get to church this morning? Didn't God do some awesome things in your life? You and I must understand that David declared, uh, Brother Macmillan, had it not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Had it not been for God who woke me up this morning, would I be here? Had it not been for God who placed breath in my mouth, would I be able to talk? God has been good. But you know what the problem is? We, 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 we suffer. We suffer as the people of God with the sin of forgetfulness. We, 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 we forget, we forget where God has brought us from. But, but listen to me, listen to me. The servant of the Lord, Ellen White, she says, she says that, that, that we have nothing to fear for the future except we forget where the Lord has led in his past deeds. I don't have to fear what's going to come for the future if I know where God has brought me from. He says, you are my people. He says, you are my people. Don't forget that. And he says, remember, look at this, look at this, verse 4. He says, remember, it was me who brought you out of Egypt. 400 years, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. 400 years, they were being beaten with whips. 400 years, they had to build bricks without straw. 400 years, they had to do what Pharaoh wanted them to do. They were not free to do anything. But God says, remember, it was me who brought you out of Egypt. 
What did God bring you from? What did God bring you from? Where did God take you from? God has been so good to us and yet so we because we suffer with the sin of forgetfulness we we are unfaithful to God. Because we forget we we because we we sit in church with our nice dresses and our nice suits and because we can wear shoes now we forget the past. We forget when we didn't have no money in our pocket, when we didn't have no food on our table. We forget all of those things because we are doing a little better. And so we take God for granted. We take God for granted. God says, look, 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 here. remember, not only did I bring you out of Egypt, he says, look here, I am the one who redeemed you. I am the one who redeemed you. He says, he says, I am the one who redeemed you. I, I am your savior. I am the one who ransomed you. Could you imagine what it, what it meant for Jesus to lay on that rugged cross that day? With his hands stretched out wide, with his head, and they placed the crown of thorns on his head. They placed nails in his feet and in his hands, and then they took that staff, that, 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 that javelin, and drew it through his side. He ransomed you. He ransomed you. He did it for me. He did it for you. And guess what? If it had only been you, he would have died for you. You're going to tell me God ain't good? God, he, he recalls his mercies. Look at it, look at it, verse 4 and 5. He says, he says, look here, not only did I redeem you, but he says, look here, I sent Moses. I sent Moses. I sent Aaron. I sent Miriam. You see, I sent them to be the leaders to, 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 to steer you out of Egypt and to bring you into freedom. So God spoke to Moses. God said to Moses, look here, man. I need you to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. <laughs> Moses began to stomach and say, oh, Lord. Sound like us when he comes to many times. Say, say, oh, Lord, I can't do that. I'm in an opposition to do that. I, I, I can't speak. I, I, I can't speak. I, I, I am not capable of doing that. God said, look here, I can send Aaron to speak for you. Huh? God, 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 look at, look at, God contradicted or counteracted everything that Moses came up with. You see, that's another lesson for us as a people of God. We have to learn to take excuses from people. <laughs> when they complain with one thing, you take it away. You, you give them something positive to deal with for the time. Huh? That's what God did. But then God, look at it. God, God now turned to Balaam's. And see, you see, what, what he turned as Balaam's intended curse into a blessing. And, and, and again, God shows us, listen to me, God shows us through this experience that, 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 that even though we mess up, he is able to overcome our messed up experiences. You know why, Sister Flavel? Because the Bible tells me, according to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 or 7, the Bible says, casting all your cares upon him because he careth for you. Listen to me. Sister Sherita, God cares for you. Brother Colin, God cares for you. And, and, and in spite of how we may feel, in spite of how difficult the journey may be, in spite of how treacherous and dangerous our path may be, we must leave here today understanding that we serve a God who cares for us. So here is the, here is the personal perplexities now. Because God now comes in verse 6. 
He goes now to verse 6 of Micah chapter 6. And I hope you're following with me. In Micah the 6th chapter, verse 6. He talks about all of the good things that he did for Israel. And then he comes now with the negative. You see it? He says to them, and he doesn't do it in an accusatory way. <laughs> this is not a life lesson for us. People may do wrong, but never accuse them of doing wrong. People may do wrong, but never accuse them of doing wrong. Am I making sense to you? Look what Jesus did. Look at look, 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 look the word. Look at the word. Jesus went to them. He says, with what shall I come? Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. He said, wherewith shall I come before the Lord? Understand me. This is a personal thing now that we have to evaluate ourselves on. Because look what is happening. God now records for them the blessing that he had for them. And how he has been so good to them. And when they recognize how good he was to them. They now ask the question. Where with shall I come before the Lord? You know this is a crucial question. For the people of God today. Because they were bringing their sacrifices of their animals until the Lord was actually wearied of them to the point where the Lord said to them, look here now, I do not care for these things. Can I ask you a question? What is the reason you do what you do? What is the reason for you doing what you do? Don't answer me. Think about it. Why do you come to church? Why do you want to serve on the board? Why do you want to be a leader? Why do you want to be a deaconess? Why don't you eat pork and crab and conch? Why don't you go to work on Sabbath? What is the reason you do what you do? <laughs> Listen to me. I'm going somewhere with this. God said to them, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams. Huh? I've had enough of it. And the fat of fed, fed, of fat of the animals fed to cattle. I do not delight in the bull, in the blood of bulls, of lambs, of goats. Brother Darling, when we study, when we study the worship of ancient Israel, it shows clearly to us, it shows clearly to us that something was wrong. What it shows to us is that the Israelites had an erroneous conception of the sacrifices they brought to the Lord and they sought to establish their own righteousness. Come on, somebody. Does that sound like us a seven-day Adventist sometimes? We want to establish our own righteousness because we keep the Sabbath. Huh? We want to establish our own righteousness because we don't eat kunkun, we don't eat crab, and we don't eat pork. Salvation is not found in what you do or what you do not do. It is found in whom you know. Get to know Jesus. You know what the problem we have in the church of living God? 
I have discovered that many of us are good at what we do, but we're not good at who we know. Many of us don't know Jesus, but we know the church. We could tell you about procedures and policies, and we can tell you about how, what the method of the church is and how the church ought to function. But when it comes to having a relationship with Jesus, we are far from that. How I know? Because I see it in your actions. We, quick, we are quick to cut you down. We're quick to mistreat you. We're quick to talk negative about you. Listen to me. When you are in love with Jesus, it makes a difference in how you behave. So, 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 so look at, look at, look at, look at. Romans chapter 10, verse 1 to 3. Go there with me. The Bible says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be what? Saved. He says, for I hear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Have you submitted to the righteousness of God? Or is it that you're still trying to be saved on your own merits? You know, the point is, the point is today that they missed the mark. They thought that all those rituals were, were for them to be saved but it was simply pointing towards the Christ who was able to save them. And then we go on to verse eight, verse eight now, which is the final part of it, verse eight. It actually challenges our motives. You see, friends of mine, it goes back to what I said earlier. When we do things, listen to me carefully. When we do things for God, why are we doing them? Why? I've told you the story before. Some years ago, I was pastoring on an island when Pastor Keith Albrick, the then president of the North Bahamas Conference, came to me. The last time before he passed away, he came to my district and he said to me, Leonardo, you can do the work of God and not know the God of the work. He says, get to know the God of the work. It stuck with me. Because so many of us are going through ritual after ritual, habit after habit. Young people, listen to me. Are you keeping church simply because your parents tell you to come? Or do you know God for yourself? What is the reason you're doing what you're doing? You can't get to heaven on pastor's coat. You can't get to heaven on your parents' beliefs. You have to know God for yourself. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to impress God with something? Are you somehow trying to put God in your debt by doing lots of things and then expecting him to do what you ask in response? Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you serving God half-heartedly? Do you do a lot of religious things simply to do them, but then you have pride or hatred in your heart? Church, listen to me. We are not going to be saved with these things in our hearts. 
You got to clear, 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 clear up your heart. Some of our hearts are too dirty, it's too sullied. We live with people in the church day in and day out and some of us don't even talk to each other. We don't even pick up the phone to find out how you're doing, but yet we're talking about we are heaven bound. We have to clear up our hearts. You know, the modern day Pharisees, even the Jews, had some vestiges of religious behavior amidst their idolatry. They put stock in that activity, believing that, 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 that it was enough to secure them as God's people. They believed that they could do anything. Listen to this. They believed that they could do anything and live any way that they wanted to live as long as they kept their religious activities. Isn't that, doesn't that sound like seven Adventists sometimes? We do dirty business all during the week, but because we come to church, we just all right. Here is what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse eight, and what does the Lord require of you? Four things. To do what? Justly. You know, this requirement points to, this requirement points to character, to our daily life, to our conduct, to our attitude toward God and man. To do justly means that we do, listen to me, Grand Stown, it means that we do what is right before God and just to man. You know what I find interesting? I look forward sometimes. I find this interesting that depending on your class in the church, some people get away with stuff and others can't get away with it. That's not just. You see, what's good for one is good for all. It doesn't matter your pedigree. It doesn't matter your name. What's good for one should be good for all. You got to do justly. You see, you, you, you have to understand that the, all of us are found in the balance and we bet not be made wanting. To do just means to be righteous before God. It means to execute or to be accurate. It means to be honest and upright. Are we like that in the church? But he says, number two, not only must you do justly, he says you must love, listen to this grand sound, we must love mercy. Hey, love mercy. You know what mercy means? Elatai, mercy is a quality of a sanctified heart. Huh? It's, a, it's, it's enlightened by the word of truth. It is one of the virtues valued by Jesus himself. No wonder Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 7, blessed are the merciful. Oh, for a church that is merciful. Oh, for a church that is merciful. It says, you see, to be merciful, it really means to be, it has to be companion with having pity for the undeserving and the guilty. This is a quality of character that the ancient Israel was lacking and of which they were very needful. Oh, to be merciful. 
But finally, he says, we got to walk humbly with God. This is a divine stipulation that sums up the implication of true worship. It points to the heart of our relationship with God. And when my life is a walk with God, my relationship with God has reached its great objective. That's why the songwriter says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. What is your walk with God like? Brothers and sisters, Jesus knew that none of our good works and none of our sacrifices could ever pay the price for our, for, for our sin demanded. So he gave his life. He gave his what? He died in our place for our sin. And he rose from the grave. He rose from the grave early Sunday morning with healing in his wings. He died in our place for our sin, but he rose from the grave and, and he is alive and he's offering us righteousness today. He's offering us forgiveness. He's offering us love. He's offering us eternal life. And if we would only stop with our religious going through the motions and simply surrender to him, it will make a difference in our lives. So Jesus is saying today, Trust me, trust me, not your religious activities, not your going to church and not your not eating and not your not drinking. Trust me. That's the controversy. Stop trusting yourself. Stop doing things to be saved. Stop acting as though you have it all together. Let go and let God. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. May today be that day when we let go and let God have his way. Would you bow your heads as we pray, Father in heaven today? I've done what you've asked me to do. And I pray, oh God, that the words that I have spoken that you have given to me would find lodgment in the hearts of your children. You've been so good to us, God. You've blessed us in so many ways. You've saved us during this week. And God, we appreciate it. I ask in the name of Jesus that you will help us as a church to be more faithful to you. Help us to love you with our whole hearts. Help us not to give up on you because you will never give up on us. Help us, oh God, in our interaction one with another to represent you, to lift you up. Oh God, help us to allow self to be crucified and to allow Jesus to be exalted. Change us, not only for time, but for eternity. And God, I pray that when all is said and done, that every person under the sound of my voice will be saved when you return. This is my prayer in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus. Let God's people say amen.